10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our stories today, the dollar's record hot streak comes under threat as Asia's biggest central bank took aim in different ways at recent rallies in the greenback. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says she's increasingly confident that the U.S. will be able to avoid a recession and contain inflation. And President Biden says he has no intention of trying to isolate China. We're going to discuss the winners and losers as India claims diplomatic victory from the G20 summit despite Xi Jinping's absence. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London alongside Shanali Basic in New York. Shanali, we're just having some lines hitting now that European Commission has cut their Eurozone GDP forecast for both this and next year. We'll have more on that in a moment. It's all about weakness in Germany. In the meantime, it's the dollar under threat today. It sure is. And if you take a look at that dollar, that has been the biggest story for the last week or so. We are looking at some relief finally as China and Japan step up to the defense of their own currencies. We'll talk about more about that currency story in a moment, Danny. But we're going to also look at S&P futures. We are also getting some relief. We are looking at S&P up more than two-tenths of one percent, almost three-tenths of one percent, and the two-year yield also feeling some relief. You're looking at a 498 handle on that two-year yield, just down at only about one basis point. Brent crude also getting some relief. You are looking at it down almost a half of one percent. However, it is still hanging out above 90. There is some section that uh, sense that there is some technical reasons that it is finally seeing some relief. However, we will keep an eye on that all week because riding above 90 is where we saw it hitting last week. Let's see if we see more pressure on the commodity there, Danny. So I'm going to dive more into these headlines from the European Commission. Let me go over them a bit. So they've cut their Eurozone GDP forecast again for both this year and next year. The numbers themselves, 0.8% is what they expect this year, 1.3% growth for 2024. Now, that also means they've reined in their inflation forecast as well for this year. Still very hot, though, 5.6%. They did have it at 58 But they've lifted their 2024 forecast, still above the 2% level. They now see coming in at 2.9%. It was 28 But the real issue here is Germany. They see a contraction this year. Previously, they saw 0.2% growth. They now see it fall 0.4% in 2023. Not a huge reaction from the euro. A couple reasons here. For one, I mean, this is a political body issuing these forecasts, so it's not as important for markets, and it's all about the dollar weakness, as you were pointing out. But we are going to get more into this story. Maria Tadeo will be interviewing the EU Commissioner Paolo Gentiloni. That will be at 6.15 a.m. Eastern and 11.15 a.m. if you are in London. But elsewhere, it's that dollar story, which continues to dominate. Um, I do have the dollar in front of me here but also if you look at the sterling for example that's gaining versus the dollar too even though Chanel has really been an Asia story we're seeing just across the board it be all about the dollar and quickly here's what Europe's looking like I mentioned the pound falling German 10 years falling the US just barely up at this point and then finally banks one of the best performing sector two things quickly to mention Italy according to local reports potentially moving and altering that windfall tax that many were concerned about on banks and the EC B, talking about reversing uh, some of the capital requirements that they impose in banks for issues with leveraged loans. Uh, an interview there from Bloomberg saying that some of those issues have been fictionally. We're going to talk more about that FX story, the dollar falling against major currencies after a record streak of weekly gains. There are two main players here. The Japanese yen gains on the BOJ governor's hawkish remarks, and the Chinese yuan also climbs from a 16-year low after the PBOC warns on FX speculation. Now, for more, we're going to bring in Bloomberg macro strategist Simon White, who joins us now. Simon, when you look at what is happening out of China and Japan, how convincing are the remarks coming out of the nations to defend their currencies against the dollar? Well, I think it's, it's very interesting. Um, you know, it's really a tale of two yuans, and in the background you have like an ongoing dollar saga. It's a tale of two yuans because basically you have the yuan has been weakening um, against the dollar. But actually, if you look at against the FX basket, the CFETs FS, FX basket, um, it's been strengthening. Um, so, um, and that's emblematic of that is the yuan events, uh, versus the yen. Um, so that's gone back above the 20 level. That's really been a line in the sand uh, for China periodically. Now, you know, it's, it's the yuan's been weakening against the dollar, but also, as we know, the yen has been weakening as well. And so you end up with the, the yuan versus the yen kind of, you know, rising a little bit further and above that, that 20 level. 
Whereas when it comes to the dollar, that's really the, the, the larger kind of um, the, the elephant in the room, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's an ongoing, despite the recent strength, you know, that there's a really structural weakness to the dollar that really comes from uh, the US running very large fiscal deficits and we have very expansive central bank balance sheets. And that's a formidable headwind yeah. for the dollar. No, no, because I think that's a really interesting debate. How much of this is about what officials did in Japan and China versus just it being prime for the dollar, especially in China? I mean, what they announced today, it hasn't been that different from what they've been doing, right? I understand it is different in Japan, but that side doesn't feel too different. Yeah, I mean, they, keep, they obviously keep pushing back. I mean, I mean, there's a huge difference between the reference rate um, and what the actual, you know, the fixing rate and what the actual um, exchange rate is right now. But I think these things build over time. You know, the pressure builds. Um, and, you know, anyone that's short the, the yuan versus the dollar, um, it becomes a, a more painful position to hold because they're going to suddenly run up against extremely high short-term interest rates, which can force them out of position. But the other thing to, to notice as well, that, that divergence into two kind of yuans, if you like, is because really the dollar is uh, incrementally becoming less important to China. Mm. So they're uh, at peak, their treasury holdings were like 1.3 trillion, if not more. They're now down to just over 800 billion. And a lot of that's valuation because obviously we've got higher interest rates. But really it means that, that they're just not as important as they once were. And this is a general kind of pattern where there's a very slow, gradual, it's going to take a long time, of course, this is not like an immediate end of the dollar, dollar story, yeah. but diminishing importance for the dollar as an international currency. Oh, interesting. Simon, thank you so much. Simon White there from our MLive team. All right, let's turn now specifically to the U.S., where Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen reiterated her confidence in a soft landing scenario, saying that she feels very good about the economy avoiding recession while taming price gains. She also said, quote, we're on a path that looks exactly like that. Let's bring in now Valerie Titel from our markets team for more. Um, Valerie, look, um, Janet Yellen, of course, is going to be more optimistic than most about the American economy. But how widespread and how backed by data is the soft landing view as it stands? Uh, well, look, she did make some very good points. She mentioned in that interview on her way back from the G20 that the recent rise in an unemployment rate is and a matter of fact, almost a good thing. It wasn't driven by layoffs. It was driven by more uh, more workers returning to the U.S. workforce. She also commented on inflation, saying that nearly every measure of inflation is on the road down. But, Danny, I want to talk about the near-term risks to that call. We have U.S. inflation on Wednesday, and risks are to the upside, especially when it comes to this core number. Remember, we've gotten core month-on-month -month at 0.2% uh, for the last two months running. The consensus estimate for Wednesday is that we do get another point too, but the risks are to the upside that this core print does come in hot. That could rattle perhaps maybe not Janet Yellen's, but many others uh, a call for us, the, the fact that the soft landing uh, is upon us if we do see this summer reacceleration and not just headline, but also core. Let's turn to the consumer because after staving off a recession for so much longer than many investors thought were possible, there are now many investors that believe the consumer is about to crack. According to the Bloomberg latest Markets Live Pulse survey, Valerie, what are the forces at play behind this? Uh, it seems a lot of bearishness recently on the U.S. consumer, a lot of that driven by the fact that excess savings in the U.S. are running out and compound that with the fact that we have student loan forgiveness also running off. In that survey, near 20 percent thought that U.S. consumption will turn negative in the fourth quarter. Another 56 percent thought it would turn negative on the early 2024. But I want to talk a bit about those student loan payments. In the month of August alone, nearly nine billion dollars went out of consumers pockets to pay those student loans remember that forgiveness ran off at the end of april at the end of august excuse me and many are seeing that as a big headwind for the consumer it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when this begins to impact consumption and remember consumption is a big one for u.s growth it makes up nearly 70 percent of gdp now alongside all of this bearishness on the u.s consumer you'd expect to have bonds 
bulls uh, waving their flag even louder. But in fact, we've not exactly seen that. We've seen people scrapping their long treasury calls. We heard from J.P. Morgan uh, over the weekend that they are now dumping their view on being long five-year treasuries. We also heard a very similar thing from Bank of America scrapping their call on a long 10-year treasury view. So very odd to see this bearishness of the U.S. consumer not necessarily paired with the fact of seeing uh, the street yeah. uh, being out there for more uh, uh, bond bull calls. Right. Well, that is the thing, right? Everyone hangs their hat on a strong consumer to say that growth is going to be okay and maybe inflation won't come down as, as much as needed. Valerie, thank you so much. Valerie Titel there. To tech, SoftBank's, <clears throat> excuse me, chip design unit arm is said to be considering raising the price range of its IPO. It comes after a meeting with investors for what would be the world's largest listing this year. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Alex Webb on this. Alex, it's that build up to the IPO hype that um, I think often people want to have, that they want to have before they release uh, the IPO to the Wolves. But how much more optimistic is, is the pricing seem to be at this point? Well, if it's true they raise the price, then clearly they're optimistic. It is interesting, though. It's almost like a sort of 800-meter race, right? They sort of pace it very, very carefully. Don't go too hard at the beginning and then gradually try to kick in the kind of final straight, right? And this seems to be what's happening. They price it maybe a little bit more conservatively. Now they put the word out that it's oversubscribed. Being oversubscribed isn't necessarily all that useful. People might express interest. Doesn't mean they're actually going to commit. Um, the yeah and so like when it gets to they're trying to create that momentum essentially create that momentum heading into wednesday in the hope that then you get more people piling in and inevitably get a bit of a pop but right. not too much of a pop enough <laughs> of a pop. sustainable pop exactly yeah. <laughs> but is it enough of a pop to give it that 64 billion dollar valuation that softbank had acquired back at stake at just about a month ago it, well look they they uh, acquired a stake valuing the company at double what they acquired it for you know, six, seven years ago. And it, it, lots of people looked at that number and said, well, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's funny money in a sense because they just, it was almost an, in, it was an internal deal, although there are some outside investors, of course, in, in the Vision Fund for whom they bought it. The, the more important thing, I think, for, our, for SoftBank is that they are going to retain something like 90% of the stock. They therefore want to see that stock you know, as Danny said, sustainably increase over the coming um, months, presumably, or years, so they can then try to gradually divest themselves of the rest of it. Having a relatively small float now, presumably, is intended to drive a little bit more demand through the mm -hmm. scarcity of it. You do have a few strategic anchor shareholders. They're not taking massive stakes. Um, they're more than sort of 100, 120 million each. But that scarcity uh, is clearly a strategic play. All right, we'll see what happens Wednesday. Alex, thank you very much. That is Alex Webb. Now, coming up on this show, Tesla having a great start to the week. Morgan Stanley's street high price target boosting that. We're going to have more on the company ahead. And also going to be catching up with Ann Katrin Peterson, senior investment strategist at BlackRock Investment Institute later this hour. Plus, we're going to have more on that G20 summit later with Lou Lukens of Signum Global Advisors. This is Bloomberg. During this difficult time, the entire world community is with Morocco, and we are ready to provide them all possible assistance. That was India's Prime Minister Modi speaking about Morocco's earthquake at the G20 summit. Joining us now is Bloomberg Middle East economy reporter Abir Abu Amar. Abir, thank you so much for joining us. Look, this, this was an extremely concerning event over the weekend. Where do we stand now in terms of the damage done and the rebuilding efforts? Hi, Danny. So, yes, I mean, the 6.8 on Richter scale um, earthquake that hit areas that are close to Marrakesh, the you know UNESCO heritage site, uh, you know a lot of a lot of the city was affected. So far, more than 2,000 people have died, and there have been more than 1,400 injuries. So far, what we've reported and from our people on ground, the rescue efforts have been complicated, and that's mainly because the epicenter of the earthquake was in a mountain area. But we know that the government has deployed. Uh, 
military logistics uh, teams, engineers, and field hospitals uh, as well. Now, Morocco has yet to, you know, say explicitly who his who it has accepted foreign aid from. Uh, but we know that the World Health Organization said that more than 300,000 people have been affected. And a Red Crescent official told our reporter on the ground that response to this earthquake will take months, if not years. Now, one thing to note here is that the IMF and World Bank annual meetings are supposed to happen mid-October, so less than a month away. We don't know if those are going to still happen. Now, those have been delayed already for two years because of the pandemic. Uh, the IMF came out with a statement, and so has the World Bank, saying that the sole focus right now is on helping mobilize technical and financial tools to assist uh, the Moroccan people. We're on track. Uh, we're keeping track of the situation and uh, statements coming out from the IMF saying whether those meetings are in fact going to happen or not. So that's the latest we have, Danny. Our thank you to Bloomberg's Abir Amu Amar. Now this weekend, world leaders met in India for the G20 summit where President Biden spoke about the tensions between China and Taiwan. I don't think it's going to cost China to invade Taiwan and in fact the opposite probably would have a the same capacity that it had before. But as I said, I'm not, we're not looking to hurt China. China's sincerely. We're all better off if China does well. Now joining us now is Bloomberg's Manaka Doshi. Manaka, you've been covering this throughout the weekend. When you look at the relationship being forged between India and the United States, where does this leave China? Well, let me address the first part of your question first. The relationship between India and the United States is definitely strengthened on account of this G20 summit. Uh, you know, you, you did see Prime Minister Modi in the White House earlier this year, President Joe Biden in New Delhi, um, a great amount of camaraderie between them. But besides that, uh, the weaker language that we saw in the communique this time around the Russian war in Ukraine could have only been possible with the U.S.'s consent. And in a sense, the U.S. Um, made that happen for India with a lot of diplomatic effort from India, but made that happen mm. because they need a counterbalance in the region to China. Equally, India needs to want to add jobs and manufacturing and is looking to take the place of China in the supply chain diversification of many Western corporations. So this mutual benefit right. just got a leg up in this G20 summit. A quick word on China, a little bit sidelined yeah. because of the absence of the Chinese President Xi Jinping. But I know you want to ask something else, so let me stop here. <laughs> Minaka, no, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you so much, though, for joining us, giving us that quick wrap. Bloomberg's Manaka Doshi reporting from a very bustling New Delhi. All right, we turn our attention now to Europe. The European Commission cutting its outlook for the euro area economy, predicting it will be dragged down by a contraction in Germany. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo from Brussels. Maria, I know you're going to be speaking with Paolo Gentiloni in just moments, in an hour or so. Can you just break down these numbers to start with from the commission? Yes, Danny. And look, we have a revision down to growth both uh, for this year and next. And all of this, uh, Danny, should not be a shock or a surprise to anyone. If you track the data that we've had over the past uh, six weeks and you see that this economy was pointing uh, to a downturn. Now, they expect the euro area now to grow 0.8%. Uh, the previous estimate was 1.1%. For next year, they see growth at one3 And they continue to point to the challenges, the risks, and the uncertainty for this economy. I should also note, uh, when it comes to just the growth uh, picture. Germany would be back in contraction and is this weight of this economy the biggest in the euro area pulling down uh, the entire uh, group that then sees uh, particular as I say this downwards provision in growth. When it comes to inflation again this number really mattered in the context of this ECB decision they were expecting on the Thursday they see inflation of 5.6 percent this year which is lower than they expected uh, in the previous uh, set of estimates but it's interesting the next year they see it at 2.9 percent that is a slight uptick from the expected prior. Of course, uh, that would
would be in the range of what the European Central Bank uh, would target, but not in the area of the below 2%, which ideally they want to get into. That is a number for next year. Of course, we should note that these are projections put out by the European Commission. The ECB will put out their own set uh, of projections on Thursday, and that will be key beyond the hold or hike uh, monetary policy. Those projections will be key, as I say, in framing the narrative of where this mm. European Central Bank will go, no matter what decision they take on the Thursday. Yeah, we'll be interesting to see again, as you say, if they have any sort of similar revisions. Maria, thank you so much. That's Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo. And as I mentioned, she will be speaking with the EU Commissioner, Paolo Gentiloni. That will be at 6.15 a.m. Eastern, 11.15 a.m. if you're in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Shanali Basic in New York with Danny Berner Berger in London. Now let's take a look at some of the stocks we're watching in pre-market trading in the United States. Tesla gaining as Morgan Stanley upgrades the stock to overweight with a street high price target of $400, up from $250. Analysts say the EV maker's Dojo computer, supercomputer may add as much as $500 billion to the company's market value. Remember, Tesla has already surged by more than double this year, up more than 5% in pre-market trading. We are also looking at Apple, set to unveil its latest lines of iPhones on Tuesday, as well as updated watches and AirPods. This comes as the firm contends with a growing ban on the use of iPhones among Chinese government workers. Now, turning to Europe, UBS is said to be cutting hundreds of wealth jobs in Asia amid slower client activity. Bloomberg learns that further cuts are expected through November. This comes just months after the bank's takeover of Credit Suisse. All right, coming up, we're going to be speaking with BlackRock Investment Institute's Ann Katrin Peterson. They've upped their short term sovereign bond call on attractive yields. More on the next, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, and here is what you need to know. The dollar's record hot streak comes under threat as Asia's biggest central banks took aim in different ways at the recent rally in the greenback. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says she's increasingly confident the U.S. will be able to avoid a recession and contain inflation. And President Biden says he has no intention of trying to isolate China. We'll discuss the winners and losers as India claims a diplomatic victory from the G20 summit, despite Xi Jinping's absence. I'm Shanali Basak in New York with Danny Berger in London. Danny, tell us about the European markets today. It, it's kind of a U.S. story. I feel like that's so bad to start a European market check like that. But it's the dollar story which seems to be dominating European assets. I have sterling in front of me. It's gaining by about four tenths of one percent, one twenty five on cable. And it's not necessarily a U.K. story. OK, maybe it's not even a U.S. story. Maybe it's an Asia story in terms of what's happening with the yen and the yuan. I know, Chanel, you're going to get into that. But it's making us all question, is this finally the turning point in the greenback? Is this the time to go long higher beta currencies like the U.K. sterling in terms of versus the dollar? I know we talked with Mark Dowding last week of Blue Bay, who said he himself was starting to trim dollar longs. It's a position that is starting to gain momentum. When it comes to treasuries, those are also so putting in some losses, and we're seeing that reflected in the German session, too. German 10-year yields, those are moving higher by just one basis point. One of the big stories in Europe today is also banks. Sure, higher yields helping with banks, but European banks are one of the best performing uh, sectors so far this morning, up by eight-tenths of one percent. Two-fold here. One, a local paper reporting that that windfall tax put in place by Maloney, they're starting to reconsider it, considering some of the reaction they had was not great. Second, ECB on also giving an interview uh, uh, officials there to Bloomberg saying that some banks have gone away to fix their leveraged loan books, fix some of those issues that they had been looking at, meaning that some of the capital add-ons that the ECB had been planning for, some of those can be removed. Shanali, all of that resulting in a rally in European banks. 
How about the U.S. pre-market session? How's that looking? We're looking at a little bit of green on the screen. We're looking at S&P futures gaining some steam here, up almost four tenths of one percent. We're also looking at a two-year yield roughly stable here. This has been above five percent at certain points of last week. Now sitting at about four ninety-eight. Danny, we are looking at Brent crude still above ninety, but also taking off some steam here. We are looking at a three tenths of one percent decline here in Brent crude again still above 90 that dollar as you've been saying is the biggest story we are looking at some cooling of that Bloomberg US dollar index by about half of 1% if we flip up the board it is worth looking at the Asian currencies here because again Japan China coming up to protect their own currencies you're looking at the yen here now about uh, $1 worth of 1% uh, worth of strengthening against the US dollar you're looking at it at about 146 42 let's see how that continues to play out because when we look at what's happening over at the yen uh, sorry the yuan we're looking at the onshore yuan was uh, strengthening more significantly earlier in the session. We were looking at about about 1% rise when you look at the uh, onshore yuan, still about 729. But remember that 1% was the strongest level since we've seen since March when we took a look at the rise in the Chinese yuan. The onshore yuan also in synchrony, about 8 tenths of 1% stronger on the day, Danny. Yeah, and look, part of this call of the dollar reaching its peak, allowing other currencies to rally versus it, is one of have yields topped out? Have we seen the most of the bond market selling? Now, we sell off. Now, we did see strategists call for that, but it sounds like some expectations are changing. Take JP Morgan. They're tempering down their expectations of a bond market rally, raising their U.S. 10-year yield target to 4.2% for year end. That's up from 3.85%. They're basing that on stronger growth and hawkish risks. Now, Bank of America has done something similar, yet on the other side of things, there's Morgan Stanley pushing back against the bears and telling investors buy Treasury. Matt Hornbach and team write, quote, market extrapolation of strong growth into the long term via higher long term real rates may not pan out, leaving the rise in long end yields vulnerable to a correction. Different views, and that's what makes a market. Let's get the take now of Ann Katrin Peterson, Senior Investment Strategist at BlackRock Investment Institute. And, and Katrin, of course, this is in large part a call about the American economy. Where do you stand? Is now a time to be buying treasuries or not? Yeah, good morning, Danny. I think that's one of the key questions, uh, really, and to answer your question. Um, on U.S. Treasuries, we have to differentiate very much between the long end and the short end here. Short-dated U.S. Treasuries remain appealing, and the case for them is bolstered by, by central banks holding policy tight. In this case, of course, the U.S. Fed holding policy tight well into next year. Now, when we look at the long end, the long end continues to be vulnerable, in our view, for three major reasons, and we think that both term premier and um, long end um, expectations might um, still go further up. The first one is that inflation might settle well above the 2% policy targets by developed market central banks. The second one is that we think that investors will demand a higher term premium given inflation volatility and also given elevated slash rising government debt in an environment of QT, of central banks, not just holding policy tight, but also continuing to shrink their balance sheet. And the third reason really is that the foreign demand for U.S. treasuries may wane over time. For example, Japanese investors may buy more into domestic um, bonds as the Bank of Japan continues to adjust its monetary policy back home. So... And Katrin, am I hearing you right then? Back up the truck, load up on curve steepeners? So we would um, continue and tactically be positioned and also strategically at the shorter end and not yet call um, for duration at uh, the long end. So some further bear steepening could be in the cards, yes. So what would us make more constructive on the long end? Two reasons, basically. The one, um, we need to see a higher, much more higher term premium from here. The other reason would be if we were to expect that the market is foreseeing a too hawkish policy path for the Fed and other central banks, and we are not there yet. 
Speaking of being there yet, we are looking forward to that CPI print here over in the United States, as well as an ECB decision that is coming a day later. When you look at the cross currents here between what is happening in the United States versus abroad, what are the shocks that investors perhaps may not be anticipating for now, especially that it's a relative story today? Absolutely. And speaking of shocks, we have to closely monitor what's happening in the United States because the United States has um, embraced two large unprecedented shocks. The first one is mismatches related to the pandemic. For example, the strong, sharp shift in consumer spending between goods and services in the U.S. This is now unwinding. And one of the reasons why we have witnessed this inflation in the US, which is taking by itself a really good story. The other shock, however, which might be binding heading into next year, is that baby boomers in the US age into retirement, meaning that there will be a continuous shortage of labor. And this may mean that US inflation is put on a roller coaster ride and could be rising again heading into 2020. Um, for emit tight labor market structurally and higher wage um, in inflation as well. Now, when we look at the ECB, um, the ECB is somewhat at a different um, uh, stage here because the euro area economy, at least to date, is facing labor market tightness, tightness but not yet as strong of a, a demographic challenge as um, the U.S., what really is key when we look at um, Thursday's meeting is that the ECB's communication may shift, whether it goes for a hawkish um, pause, which mm. is my base case, mm -hmm. or a dovish hike, that the communication will shift from how high policy rates get to how long they will stay there. That's BlackRock's and Katrin Peterson. We thank you for your time. Now, coming up next, we'll speak to Lou Lukens. He's Signum Global Advisor's senior partner. Up next, we'll talk about that G20 meeting. This is Bloomberg. He has his hands full right now. He has a overwhelming unemployment with his use. One of the major economic tenants of his plan isn't working at all right now. I'm not happy for that, but it's not working. So he's trying to figure out, I suspect, I don't know, just like I would, trying to figure out what to do about the particular crisis we're having now. That was President Biden speaking about President Xi at the G20 summit. Xi's decision not to attend the G20 may have been intended to deny India its moment. But instead, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, along with the U.S. and Europe, figured out how to more effectively counter China on the world stage. Now, joining us now is Lou Lucan, senior partner at Signum Global Advisors. When you look at the events of the G20, how do you think it really sets up India to compete on a global scale, especially given the directory or the trajectory rather of its uh, growing uh, economy. So look, I think President Modi and India, did, Prime Minister Modi, did a very, very effective job of, of placing India at the center of this very important summit. Um, the negotiating team that he had that brought all the parties together, all the countries together on a joint declaration, I think was very impressive. And I think you're right. I mean, China, but through his absence or through President Xi's absence, missed an opportunity to, to sort of weigh in on these important issues and, and help to sort of create this dynamic of the United States now even more closely aligned than it was before with India as basically a counterweight to China. When you saw President Biden speak about China and the threats that it posed to Taiwan in particular, he basically said that President Xi has more to think about with its own economy. You are getting a lot of conflicting data coming out of China. What did you make of President Biden's remarks? Well, I think, I, I think the economic situation in China plays two ways, right? I mean, maybe President Biden is right and that President Xi is too much on his plate and he will be less aggressive in the South China Sea and particularly in regards to Taiwan. The flip argument, though, is that invading Taiwan or taking action against Taiwan is an effective way for him to rally the country behind him. And if he starts to feel that the people of China 
are slipping away from his grasp of power because the economic situation is difficult, he could easily use an outside distraction to try to rally the country behind him. That, that is such an interesting point, and it's one we've, we've seen happen, I mean, recently, too, in, in terms of taking that sort of action. But does that make you concerned about America and the West's readiness to, to deal with a more aggressive China then, if that's sort of the attitude that Biden has at this moment? Well, I think part of the reason that Biden goes to these summits and travels around the world is to start laying the groundwork for how our, we and our allies would work together to counter an aggressive China in the South China Sea, and particularly in regards to Taiwan. So, you know, I think we're not there yet, and I think certainly there will be differences if that happens in how the Europeans react, how the Americans react, how the Global South reacts. But I think part of Biden's purpose in these diplomatic trips is to start building the framework for a comprehensive way to combat China's aggression. And, and, and would you say that coming out of this, like, okay, Washington has definitely learned the language of the global south. Are you confident in that? I, th I think we're getting there. Yeah. I mean, certainly, I think the, the, the Biden administration is taking a different approach to the glo global south than previous administrations have. It remains to be seen if it's effective. I mean, remember a year ago at the, G, at the G7, they pledged $600 billion to help infrastructure in the global south. And yesterday or this weekend, another big pledge at the G20. You know, a lot of times these pledges are made and then sort of fizzle out. So we'll have to see what actually happens and if there's follow-up. I would love for you to comment on the, the approach to Ukraine, because on one hand, they did reach a consensus. On the other hand, it wasn't as strong of a language as Ukraine would have hoped for. What does this mean moving forward? Well, I, I think there would have been, I think, a very serious debate within the Biden administration and his national security team over, do we sort of boycott this language because we think it's not strong enough, and I'm sure they did not feel it was strong enough, or... Do we sort of lower our expectations a little bit and join with the rest of this global community, the G20, to put out a, a, a solid, unified statement? And I think the decision would have been made at the end of the day to, to meet these diplomatic needs going forward that we were just talking about, that it's more effective to be on side with all these other countries than to create a rift over the language of this declaration. What do you think it also means for the United States' approach to the Ukrainian defense moving forward, especially because if you look at what's happening in the U.S., there's uh, their own potential for a government shutdown just really weeks from now? Well, exactly. I mean, the United States Congress is basically, you know, has to deal with government funding. I think, I think we probably are looking at a shutdown in, in the coming weeks. I, but there's also this move that you allude to in Congress of, a lot of reduced amounts, levels of support for the U.S. assistance to Ukraine. I think that level of assistance is still pretty solid, certainly in the Senate and certainly from the White House. But there's a growing group of, of representatives in the House of Representatives, probably about 100, who think that we have done enough for Ukraine and will push hard during these budget negotiations to cut off aid or to reduce aid to Ukraine. Our very big thanks to Lou Lucan of Signum Global Advisors. Remember, Lou is the former Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in London. Now coming up, some of the biggest multi-strategy hedge funds are faltering. We'll have more on that with Bloomberg's Hema Parmar up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London alongside Shanali Vasek in New York. Let's get you now set up for the day. A quick look at what's ahead. Apple's latest launch event will be coming up on Tuesday. The new iPhone 15 and next-gen smartwatches will be unveiled. Fed officials in a blackout period, but we are going to get the U.S. CPI on Wednesday. PPI and retail sales will hit on Thursday. Plus, it's the main event. ECB rate decision and President Lagarde's press conference will happen on Thursday. Also, if that's not enough for you, we're also going to get the ARM IPO. It's expected to begin trading then as well. Then finally, rounding out the week with a China rate decision and a data dump. Janali. We're looking at some of the largest multi-strategy hedge funds that are struggling to keep up this year. They're trailing their own performance, their past performance, as well as other types of funds. And joining us now to discuss this is Bloomberg's Hema Parmar. What kind of performance are we talking about here? Because some of these funds are still up close to double digits. Some of them have reversed their losses, but it's looking pretty meager. 
Right, so if you look at one of the multi-strat indices, um, since 2019 they were up about 7%, but this year alone they're up less than 4%. So the numbers aren't super impressive. Um, Citadel, for example, up 11% so far this year, not bad. Last year they were up 38%. Um, Bal Yasny and Schoenfeld, they're on the other side of the spectrum, um, they together have, have returned less than about 3% to investors so far this year. Exodus point up just 4% this year. These are not terribly impressive numbers, especially if you consider the fact that we are so far into the year. So there's only a few more months left to impress with their investors. Hey, Hema, mm -hmm. Hema, why? <laughs> why is this strategy underperforming? Why has this year been so dismal? Yeah, so there's a few reasons why. Um, you know, it's with this rising interest rate environment, it's been a little tricky for them to make money with the risk-free rate at, at about zero. Um, a 7% return is pretty good, but when it's at five, that number is less impressive. And then when you look at the stock market, well, a lot of the S&P's rallies have been, been driven by just a few stocks, and so that environment doesn't really bode well for these multi-strategy firms that are often market neutral. Um, these are strategies that perform well in, in environments that have more volatility, that have market dispersion, and this hasn't been quite that environment for them. There's a lot of money that flooded into the strategy, but even more than money, there has been a lot of leverage mm -hmm. that has been offered to help these strategies win yeah. these returns. What are the risks that investors are now pointing to as mm -hmm. the returns are starting to come down? Yeah, so there's a few things that people are really thinking about, investors especially in these returns. Um, one is the risk of crowded trades. A lot of these funds, they've become very big. They may in invest in the same sorts of um, assets, and so the risk of crowded, crowded trades seems to be one that people are talking about. Um, also keep in mind, these are very very expensive funds. Um, and so um, hedge funds were charging um, pass-through fees of as much as 7% last year for these multi-strategy funds. That really eats into returns, um, especially when the numbers so far haven't been that impressive. And then keep in mind the fact that these funds have lockups. So investors are stuck in these funds for many years more than they were before. Now, when you look at the returns largely year to date, the, mm -hmm. the, the performance is much more significant than you saw the muting down to October. Mm -hmm. And September has already started off kind of choppy. Yeah. How anxious, when you think about the tone that people mm -hmm. are taking when they speak to you, yes. are they getting more anxious as the year goes through? I think there is some anxiety because the macro funds haven't performed well, the multi-strat funds haven't performed well, the equity funds, some of them are doing okay, but when you compare them to the NASDAQ or to the, the S&P, the, the indices are doing a lot better. So I think there is some wariness, um, whether it's so much so where some of these investors will actually redeem from these managers, I think they're looking at a few years. How has that manager been doing for a couple years in a row um, or you know, since inception? But um, yeah, there's, there's a little bit more concern than there has been before. Yeah, Hema, I was going to say on that point, I mean, last year was so strong for a lot of the macro funds. Mm -hmm. How fickle do you expect flows to be? Is this year enough to undo some of the stellar returns that they were able to squeeze out for their investors in 2022? Right. So the macro funds, they've had, you know, an up and down year for, uh, for some time. And um, they have fall in investor favor, they fall out of investor favor, uh, sort of depending on how things go. Um, a lot of funds had been waiting for them to perform really well, and they had a couple years when they were doing so. Uh, a lot of these funds have significant lockups as well, too. So the, the hedge funds these days, especially the big ones, they try to structure themselves so that they are not as um, um, susceptible to the investor whims. Um, so if the strategy falls out of favor, if they're locked up for a few years, then I think the funds would think, well, okay, if we're better in a couple years, um, the investors can't leave, and then we can impress them again. So you're seeing a broader shift in the industry to locking up capital for as long as the fund possibly can, to be honest. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Hema Parmar. The amazing thing here, Danny, is that you are also looking at an S&P 500 that is down for the month as well. So even those long-only funds have some trouble ahead for them. Yeah, exactly. And I can't help but think about so many of the uh, non-long-only funds, but got so married to positions last year where you basically just shorted everything. Or even just, even forget that, Shanali, so many of the themes we thought would be present this year, whether it would be a strong China, whether it would be the year of the bonds, all of those calls have been wrong. We've had to rethink a lot of consensus this year in 2023. We'll do a lot of rethinking this week, Danny. That does it for us today, though, for Early Edition. Surveillance is up next. We'll hear from European Economy Commissioner Paolo Gentilini, among others. This is Bloomberg.